Hi everyone, thank you so much for uh, tuning in to this week's edition of the Recruitment Reality Podcast. We have uh, a global edition, um, a side of the world that we do quite a lot of work in, but um, I don't get many guests, mainly due to the fact that most people aren't willing to stay up late and speak to me. Um, whereas Sabrina, thank you so much for being that person that is willing to. Um, and I'm delighted to, uh, I guess, welcome you onto the podcast, Sabrina, from, uh, well, the founder of Avanti Search. And yeah, I, I will do you a disservice. You have such an interesting sort of background journey through talent and beyond. Um, so it would be amazing if you could just give the audience uh, a quick insight into, uh, into you and obviously into Avanti and what you do as a business. Thank you so, so much, Woody. Um, I am so honoured to be here, especially because I get to talk to you about all the things I love, but that some of the weird and wonderful stuff I've done in my past that's completely unrecruitment related. Uh, but I digress. I'm Sabrina Husami. I'm a 36-year-old Australian, uh, born and raised in Sydney of Lebanese and Indian descent. I'm an ex-Miss Australia uh, for the Miss World competition, an ex-apprentice contestant, and I also own my own recruitment agency, which is why I'm obviously having a chat with you today. So the business is called Avanti Search and it we recruit across all corporate verticals. So any white collar business, right from their front desk through to their C-suite executive team, we do that kind of varied generalist work for across Australia. Awesome. So, I mean, it's like, where do you start with an intro like that? Uh, you're also an award-winning founder of a business in Australia, right? Am I, I'm not wrong in saying that? I um, mean, award is a strong word. <laughs> you might, I don't know if you're talking about um, making the top 20 women making booze. Yeah. yeah, in Australia, yes, I did make that list um, and very, very grateful to be included on it. I still don't know what I did, Woody, beyond just being extremely passionate about I guess, a partnership approach to recruitment, you know, to give you an insight as to why I started Avanti Search, I spent 10 years internally as a talent acquisition leader and dealt with many agencies in my time and just hated how transactional they are over on this side of the world and started to learn that that was actually everywhere. I started to recruit in the UK and other parts of Asia. <laughs> and I was like, bloody agencies, what the hell is going on with these guys? Like they are so transparently just trying to put a bum in a seat rather than partner with the business and figure out what you actually need, um, which was my internal approach. So I just went, you know what, post-COVID recruitment was booming here in Australia agencies were just making money hand over fist and I thought it was the right time to launch an agency with a difference which was how do we partner with businesses to make sure that we're actually bringing talent that will stay in the long term that means something to the team and that's going to be happy most importantly because mm. I think that became the most important thing to everyone coming back off the back of COVID it was no longer what role can I make the most money in it was what's going to give me stability and security and long-term job satisfaction so that's why I started it. Yeah, amazing. Uh, and I think it's so interesting. You know, most people make the opposite jump. So right. most people start in agency and then go, oh, this isn't, you know, everything you've described is what pushes them out of agency and into internal um, because they go, I'm sick of just putting bums on seats. I don't like revenue targets. I like working with people. I want to help build cultures, et cetera. Um, and they go, right, the only way I'm going to do that is to move internal. And then what happens is an internal, they have to use loads of recruitment agencies uh, <laughs> that just want to put bums on seats. Yeah, right? and, and the true. frustration is just cyclical. Um, and look, I, I, don't, I, I, I totally agree that in the agency world, the majority of people are about making fees and placements. There are obviously a lot of great recruiter uh, agencies out there um, and some that really do, you know, like partner as, as kind of what you're talking about. Um, it'd be great to know, I guess, from a from an Avanti perspective, like a bit of a pitch, really. What, what do you feel kind of makes you different as an organisation? What a great question. I think 
the fact that we're small, it's myself and two other people means that we're really selective about the work that we bring on board. Firstly, we won't just take any job because we've got a thousand recruiters to fill those jobs. Um, meaning that we partner with good companies that seem really authentic and ethical in the way that they operate. And the fact that we can recruit just about anything for your business as a team of three, I think is a really wonderful thing to have a one-stop shop that you can go to who's still a partnering agency, not just a, sure, we've got loads of people, let's just put one of them <laughs> in your business. And then the final thing is that I, I myself, I'm a d diversity and inclusion consultant most specifically within the disability inclusion space. I actually have a disability myself too, in fact. I have type 2 bipolar disorder and I also have a hearing impairment, um, which I wear hearing aids for. So I've done a lot of consulting with different committees around Sydney around how to make things more accessible for people that live and work in the city. Um, and as a result, I also bring that lens to my recruitment. You know, how do we make things more inclusive for the people that we bring into the businesses um, that we place them into? So... Yeah, that's, that's our point of difference, I think. So how, how does that um, sort of manifest itself in, in your process? I.e., you know, when you're partnering with a company as a recruiter, are you also then giving some of that sort of DEI advice and really helping them maybe change some of their processes to make sure they're as inclusive as possible? How, do, how, does it, how do you actually consult on that front? as a recruiter, not yeah. as a consultant, but as a recruiter? Great question. I, I find that if I see parts of a business's recruitment process that are clearly operating to the contrary of inclusivity, I'll just raise them naturally. I'll be like, hey, guys, I noticed that you said the next round for this tech candidate, let's say, is a two-and-a-half-hour um, pair programming test online. How do you think it's going to sit with a single mum looking after her kids at home to have to sit a two and a half hour test in the middle of the day um, as opposed to somebody who's not in her position and therefore are we creating this mm -hmm. unwitting barrier to entry for that woman? Mm -hmm. You know, if you're saying we need more girls in tech and all the rest of it, well, what are we doing about <laughs> that process to make sure that it's a bit more inclusive? So it just comes out, you know, you, you can't help but share that knowledge and that advice when you can see that there are these clear barriers in the process, I think. I, to I totally agree. I mean, so we're a neurodiverse business, like 50% of us are dyslexic, basically. Um, I'm dyslexic myself so we have a big focus on on trying to build software that that really you know uh enables those kind of things so whether it's transport reducing transport or whether it's you know having a thinking time that has reasonable adjustments built into it that kind of stuff and you do just find yourself when you're on a call with somebody and they especially if they're like oh we want to be more inclusive and then they go, but we've got to have thinking time that absolutely just cuts people off and then they have to give the answer. And if they're not ready, you know, because we've got to put them under pressure and, you know, that's the level of pressure that they're going to be in the job. And I'm like, they're never going to be under that level of pressure in the job. Not unless you're like, you know, in the police, let's say, where you've got to make a snap decision. Bomb squad. And if you don't, yeah. some, something, yeah, some, yeah, exactly. I, which, which wire do I cut? You know, if you're sending an email to somebody, you can write a hundred drafts of it, right? And these organisations, they get so like, yeah, but then they can then they can research what the answer is. I'm like, yes, then they could research what the answer is and get the right answer. Wouldn't that be amazing? So you do find, right, that it just kind of comes out naturally. I think what I really like about your example is it's not just that. That's about inclusivity, basically. It's not you know, diversity, equity, da, da, da. that's about inclusive, including people. And really, if you have a mandate to have more women in tech, like, are you really being inclusive? And is your process actually enabling that? Um, which I which I really, really love. How are you how are you seeing that? Like in the Australian market? I don't have that much to do with the Australian market. Like we work with a couple of theme parks, which is awesome. Um, but I don't I don't know like how hot a topic is DEI in the market and, and who are the kind of big influence of, influences of that? 
I cannot tell you how hot of a topic. Like it is probably the number one thing on um, especially big business agenda. And I guess it is those big businesses. We're talking big four consulting firms, the big banks that lead the charge in terms of trying to be best practice and really visibly seen as proponents of DEI. Um, we call it D&I over here, diversity and inclusion. Uh, so D&I, goodness, such a hot topic. But I think the biggest uh, driver uh, for businesses to actually do better is when you start to put in front of them the statistics that show bottom line improvement as a result of making their business more inclusive. Surprise, surprise, businesses are you know, designed to make money. And if they know they're going to make more money by having more diverse talent that is actually included meaning not just talent that has a seat at the table, but has the safety to mm -hmm. speak up and share their thoughts um, in all their complex yeah. ways, then that's generally what tends to give them a bit of a boot up the ass and get them going. Can I say that? Can I swear on this podcast, Woody? You can say whatever shit you like. <laughs> um, yeah, Hi. absolutely. Swear, swear away. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Billy Connolly fan. I actually, one of the first things I ever watched of Billy Connolly was his tour of Australia. So uh, swear as much as you like. There's, it, why would you not have something like a swear word to really accent the way that uh, you, you want to emphasize something? That's my opinion, not the opinion of Willow, you know, whatever we want to put on the, uh, put on the thing. So, uh, so yeah, no, swear away, all good. Um, my fear when it comes to things like what you've just said, and, and I'd really welcome your opinion on it, is when it comes to the big companies, it does become bums on seats, you know, rather than having a voice in the organization. Um, we're kind of going off a talent tangent here, but if you were to give advice to an organization like that, that, you know, had a quota before, but what they're trying to do is have actual inclusivity, right? What would your advice to them be to, to enable that person actually having a voice as opposed to looking around the room and going, ah, I was the quota. Brilliant. Yeah, what a great question. I think it's, it's twofold. The first is in bringing on board people that feel like they'll not only just appear at the table but have a voice at that table, you have to remove as many barriers to entry as possible. So again, touching on that point of rather than having a quota in recruitment, let's say we must interview one female for every male or have three female panel interviewers as well as three male panel interviewers. Rather than doing that, just think about what the unique circumstances are that different types of people find themselves in in a recruitment process and how do we maintain equity amongst all of those different variables. It's a hard thing to do, but once you've got it, the beauty of it is that it applies to every type of candidate, right? It's not just trying to make things fairer for females. Suddenly you're also making it fairer for all number of people that don't sit inside of a standardized box. So there's a beautiful flow on mm -hmm. effect. Um, but secondly, once to answer your question more succinctly, once they join the business, I think the thing that creates the most inclusivity is when there is a sense of psychological safety within a team. And that safety is enhanced by a manager showing vulnerability, saying, I don't know all the answers. You all are in my team because I hope you can provide them to me. Um, and everyone here has to have a say. So the people that might be introverted, for example, because of cultural differences, they might be the quieter type because they're taught not to speak up in their particular culture, are still given airtime through virtue of the manager prompting it and saying, I would like to know what you think, even though you didn't put your hand up in a meeting, you didn't say anything at all. Um, and then follow mm. up on whatever advice was given. Actually pay attention to it. Don't just give it some airtime, but act upon it, if that makes sense. And that starts to build this realisation in teams that everyone here not only has a say, but that say, if it's a smart one, is acted upon. It's not just the guys that are, you know, having drinks with the manager after work and a very samey, sort of fits the same mould as that manager. It's everyone that's being considered and then acted upon. Yeah. The acting upon is like, to me, that's the so most important. important thing. Yeah. Because yeah. otherwise it's just, I gave you airtime. I've done it. Quota again, like tick box. I'm no longer biased because I let you speak. Correct. You know, I, actually, I actually value your opinion enough to act on it. 
And I think one thing that people are scared of sometimes, again, co correct me if I'm wrong, because I am absolutely no expert, um, is they're scared of opening the floor to opinions and then disagreeing with the opinions. So they kind <laughs> so of, <true. laughs> what, what, what they do is, rather than acting upon it by saying, I really like that idea, but I'm not sure it's right. They go, yeah, great idea. And then slide it under the carpet. And that's, you know, that's them included, right. job done. Siri's trying to trying to weigh in on the conversation. <laughs> Siri's adamant um, about this too, Woody. AI has yeah, a say as well. Absolutely. Let's give her a seat at the table. <laughs> <laughs> poor, poor Siri, poor Siri. She's left out of everything. So, yeah, I, I think that's really important is that the, the point that actually the action can be a constructive negative bit of feedback. Yes, right? it absolutely. It doesn't always have to be like, yeah, let's let's go and do it and then do nothing. That's yes. the worst possible thing. Yeah, it's not a pandering exercise. You're right. It's just it's just an engagement exercise. Actually engage with what's being shared, whether that is just yeah. to push back and say, not the right idea for right idea for these reasons, or whether it's to go, great, great shout, let's give that a try. Yeah. And, it, and it's basically just treating one person's opinion the same way that you would treat the person that you've dealt with for the last 20 years that looks, sounds, acts like you. You know, it's, it, there's no difference in their opinion, except for the, the fact it might come from, from a, through a different lens, basically. Um, so uh, switching gears slightly back to, I guess, recruitment and talent. Um, <laughs> and what I said we were going to talk about before we started recording or the question I normally ask, which is, so in in your market right now, like what are you seeing as the kind of biggest trends or challenges that um, your, your customers are facing? Uh, hiring quality talent is the biggest one and especially hiring it at a, what they perceive to be a fair price. We are seeing the highest ever um, ad rates like job ads on seek which is our biggest job board in australia historically we are seeing relatively low number of applicants it's the lowest unemployment rate we've had in decades and so what mm. it means is that the people that are applying are kind of i hate to say it but bottom of the barrel in terms of the skill set that they bring to the table and it's not just experience it's actual skill set that they bring to the table so even transferable um, experience is not really mm. rearing its head the, the right way. So yes, finding really good people and finding them at a palatable price is so difficult for businesses in Australia right now. We're also so far away so from ha everything, ha Woody. We are so far from everything. And those border closures were <laughs> bloody hell for us. So there was this incredible shortage in the talent market over here we've only got about 27 million people in this country. Like it's not a yeah. hugely populated country for how large we are. Um, and so many of them are burgeoning talents, not well-established talent that knows what they're doing a lot of the time. So it created this crazy labor market shortage and everyone got to name their price this time last year. People were writing their own paychecks and it's not gone away, unfortunately. Yeah. Wow. It's, um, it's just crazy to think how big Australia is and the fact that you've got a third the number of people uh, to compare to Britain. Yeah. You know, I can't imagine what kind of challenge that must be. Yeah. So how, how where are you, where are you finding talent and like, how are you kind of helping clients overcome that problem? We don't advertise. We only had home. Um, so the way that we proactively find this passive talent is LinkedIn recruiter, networking, referrals. Um, we do a lot of uh, revisiting of previous talent. So I guess you could call that database management. I hate all of those recruiter terms, though. Really, it's just about who do we already know that we can tap into um, and who out there is so specific in terms of meeting the client's needs that we simply must tap them on the shoulder, despite the fact that they're a stranger to us. Um, I think that's also a big point of difference at Avanti Search. We spend more time than any other agency I know, and I've got a lot of agents in my network, on the brief with a hiring manager. So much time on that brief. Sometimes we'll do two sessions on a single brief for a role. 
And it just means that in that targeted search for people, we're searching in a lot of detail and we're assessing really thoroughly ourselves before we present anyone to an employer. One of my pride points is I say to them, I don't want to show you six CVs. I want to show you two and say, I can almost guarantee you're going to hire one of these two individuals based on our assessment. Mm -hmm. And how do they react to that? Um, half of the time they love it and half of the time they're like, no, God, that's not enough of a comparison. I need to see more people than that. And then once they start seeing those third, fourth, fifth, sixth people, they're just like, oh, God, I really did waste my time there, didn't I? And I'm like, I fucking told you. Like, I told you. This is number one. Yeah. This is number two. Here are your other three just for safety's sake. And you're welcome. I wish you'd listen to me from day one. <laughs> and they're like, so do yeah. I. Oh, and, and by the way, candidate one's now gone somewhere else correct because you decided you needed so many people in your process exactly right yeah yeah again it's just one of those like habitual behaviors of of hiring managers that they're like how could how could i possibly know whether this person's right like there's a girl that we hired um and i probably interviewed too many people before i met her but then as soon as i met her i offered the, the job to her like on the day, I was like, this is the person, job done, don't need to, nobody else, she's the one, she's perfect, she's going to be amazing. Um, and, you know, you have to move that quickly. I don't understand why people are like, especially when they know in their gut that the, the person is right, but they're still like, oh, yeah, but, you know, if I don't, I think it's, again, it comes back to fear, like you're 90% more motivated by fear than, uh, than uh, reward. So they're fearful that if it goes wrong and their director, manager, owner turns around and says, how many people did you interview? You know, oh, I only interviewed two. Like they're going to get shot down, basically, which is a very, very strange thing. This thing that you said earlier, I really relate to Woody, which was most people make the transition out of agency into internal recruitment because they hate that transactional salesy attitude and they love the partnership approach, they go internal. I started my career as an agency recruiter. My very first year was as an agency recruiter before I moved internal and then 10 years of internal and then I built Avanti Search. So the, the thing that I'm so pleased to see the back of when I compare year one in agency versus a decade on are those managers who used to say, present me with a short list of 15 to 20 people and then I will tell you whom I would like you to interview and then I will interview the ones that you'd like. I just, can you imagine in the current market first having to come up with 15 or 20 <laughs> and then going through the assessment process from there by the time you've gotten to candidate three, 17 of them are gone, you know what I mean? <laughs> So, yes, thank God for that. Thank God that's gone. Yeah, it's not, uh, it, well, like you say, in the current market, it's, it's just not normal. So, and thinking, of, you know, about, uh, I guess, long shortlist, shortlist of talent, uh, shortage of talent, etc. Obviously, the borders are, are relatively back open. We've got this wonderful new arrangement with you where all of our grads can go and work and pick fruit uh, on a three-year visa, how, how do you how do you think uh, that's maybe going to change things, if at all? You know, I, I know so many recruiters <laughs> that have just moved to Australia. I'm like, really? That's like a really needed skill in Australia? Like, yep, yep. Um, so I'd love to know, you know, what, what effect over or what you see in the next 12 months, whether it's more talent coming in, from overseas, whether it's, you know, upskilling or reskilling of talent, you know, what, what do you see in the next 12 months for Talent Australia? Yeah, I, I am so pleased to see this is happening again. I say again, because I'm not joking, I think 80% of my personal circle of friends are English recruiters, people that came over here years ago, <laughs> as, either as recruiters or retrained immediately um, as such, because there's always been a school shortage when it comes to good recruiters over here. Um, and then fell in love with the country and stayed. 
So it's about time. We missed you. Welcome back. Brits, it has been a trip being without you for so long. <laughs> well, new yous anyway. We're used to the old yous that came over here <laughs> six or yeah, seven they're, years back. They're basically they're Australian. Now, they're right? Aussies now, yeah. They shiver when it goes below 20 degrees Celsius, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no longer can call themselves English, that's for sure. Um, yes, my fiancé is one such, by the way. <laughs> He's a wonderful, oh, guy. Nice. wonderful English recruiter. Um, but I think that because we're going to see again this fresh batch of talent who are younger and less established in their recruitment careers, what it will mean for talent acquisition is five or six years from now, we'll hopefully again start to see a nice strong crop of established recruiters um, having learnt the local jurisdictions and all of the laws that come with it and how weird and wonderful the Aussie market is because it is an incestuous, small, skill-short market but once you establish yourself here and you build that network, you're in, right? It's it's you mm. you're remembered by candidates because it's not a big country. Yeah, I love that. It's uh, it's almost like, I mean, look, the the difference is so huge between here and there because there's four and a half thousand agencies in Australia, and there's forty one thousand in the UK, uh, which is why job adder. I don't know if you ever use Job Adder. Yes, but that's, an that's our CRM. Yep. Recruitments, is it? There you go. Great business. Shout out to Job Adder. Yeah. That's why they started in Oz, and then very quickly after their, um, you know, traction and investment, they came over to the UK to try and make the most of that. And I think, yeah. I think they're doing pretty well at it, which is yeah. good. Um, just kind of reaching the end of the conversation, but um, before we. Uh, wrap up with your kind of your two two or three tips that you want to give to either other recruiters or in-house recruiters, hiring managers, candidates, whatever. What kind of technology do you use? Obviously, as a as a small agency, you know, every bit of spend really makes a difference, right? So, what are the things that you're willing to invest in, and and why? My search tools are the things that I spend the most money on. Um, that and marketing, because again, in Australia, if you if you haven't heard of them, you don't trust them a lot of the time. So marketing is incredibly important. Um, so marketing budget accounts for probably I'm going to say a third of my um, business spend. Uh, this is taking away salary of my staff, of course. And then the other two thirds are on the tools that we use to search, namely LinkedIn. Um, Zoom Info Talent OS is a new platform that we've been trialing for the last three months, which is basically a B2B database. So it's got lots of contact details in there. And um, to some extent, when we need it, we'll, we'll also spend on things like Sync Talent Search, which is kind of similar to LinkedIn um, as a search mechanism. And then Job Adder. Job Adder is truly a wonderful CRM. It does keep us accountable, keeps everything where it should be. It's a great little tool. I love it. Nice. Cool. It's always good to get insight into like what is your what is your tech stack as a small business and uh, job adder I think started off in your world you know with mainly smaller agencies yeah uh, but they've just and changed let me tell you Woody so when I used to use job adder maybe eight years ago I'm going to say it was a different system the way they have <laughs> evolved this software is truly incredible like it was the most basic box ticking system and now it is so multifunctional i i am such an advocate that i was the most skeptical trialing it again for the first time i'm a convert for sure joe batter you can hire nice. me anytime well, to sing your praises to the world <laughs> yeah and i'll take a small fee uh for the uh for the shout out just a little on one podcast um yeah, just a little one. Um, but no, great. Thanks for the insight. And and yeah, so to, to wrap up, it would be great to hear like some advice from you. Like if you've got a couple of tips maybe for hiring managers or candidates in the market that are looking, um, they would be amazing to hear. My three tips to candidates uh, would be at the start of your process, this is when you're putting a CV out there, get some stats onto your CV. No longer are words enough. Numbers are what are really driving a lot of managers' decision-making, I'm finding, especially if you're in any sort of 
quite KPI driven role. So if you're a salesperson and you don't have numbers on your CV, get them on their ASAP um, and shorten that CV. One to two pages is the trend right now for a reason. There is research showing that recruiters and hiring managers don't spend more than 30 seconds on a CV before moving on to the next one. That's the average amount of time spent on a CV, 30 seconds. So keep it short. <laughs> keep it short and get your numbers on there. The second tip would be what I call the golden interview question. So one of the most common thing people do in an interview, candidates do an interview, is to talk a lot to provide as much detail as they can about their achievements and experiences because they want to get the point across, right? You, you really want to feel like I've said everything I can say about myself to this interviewer and that's going to get me the job. The truth is you often lose the interviewer when you speak at length. So the golden interview question that you can ask an interviewer after delivering a very short and sharp answer to their question is, does that answer your question or would you like me to elaborate more for you? And suddenly you're putting the interviewer back in the driver's seat to say, actually, yeah, that does answer the question for me moving right along. Or there's one point I'd like you to elaborate on. Can you speak specifically to that point? And mm. you're shining rather than drowning them in words and words and words. So that's tip number two. Tip number Love three that. would be, Always have questions prepared for the interviewers at the end of your process. Obviously, you don't want to be there. Oh, no, I have no questions. You've answered everything. There's no way an interviewer has answered everything you could possibly want to know. So if you have to have a single question in your back pocket to ask them, to impress them with, it should be this. Um, what's the vision for the company's evolution over the next three years? And how does this role that I'm interviewing for fit into that vision? How does it help to achieve that vision? Because, A, you'll learn about where the company is headed, what kind of trajectory and stability comes with that company, and B, you'll start to understand how your role fits into the grand scheme of things and become either more invested because you're like, yeah, bloody hell, I really want to contribute to that vision, or go, no, nah, that's a misalignment, that's not something I'm interested in at all, I'm wasting my time here. And so you can cancel out a bad job before you get into it rather than after my top three tips for candidates. Um, for clients, I'm going to give my absolute favorite tip in terms of redressing salary inequity. You know, we talk a lot about the fact that people are paid these crazy different rates, especially now people hired post-COVID versus pre-COVID. As I said, especially over here in APAC, they're writing their own paychecks. So anyone that's been in their job for a while and still on their old salary, anyone that's switched jobs recently has probably gotten a really significant pay bump. So for people that are going through recruitment processes and you have the power in your hands, obviously, to dictate what you think is fair for a person to be paid. And if you hear a candidate who's come out of an eight year job, a seven year job and is sitting on quite a low salary and is expecting not much more. Instead of viewing them as a bargain and just paying them that lower rate redress that inequity by saying, do you know what? I'm going to be really honest with mm -hmm. you. In today's market, you could be earning 20 to $30,000 more than that. So let's talk about that. Let's get you where you should be. And that way, A, you're changing a person's life for the better. That's the biggest piece. But B, you're also going to make sure that you don't have these, these funny inequities within your team in future that then make it harder for you to hire at a higher rate when you have to because you're like, well, Jane's been here for bloody seven years and she's on 30K less than that. I can't pay a new person 30K more, mm. right? That old mm. hiring manager dilemma. So, yes, that's my number one tip for, for managers right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it like that bleeds into budgets even like when you're when you're going right we need three more heads and they go well you found uh you found jane on 30k so looks like you're staying with that right um you can you can get three more of her and you start, and then you're like no she was a bargain and then they're like oh, well, find us more bargains bargain. you one. <laughs> yeah so you're just shooting yourself in the foot by offering the person with what you can get away with as opposed to what they're worth um, alongside all the other things that kind of go into that, but that should be enough of a reason to do it. Um, well, look, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Sabrina. It's been awesome to talk to you. I know it's obviously late there, so I'm sure you're ready to log off and uh, relax finally for the evening. Um, 
but I really appreciate your time. I could have talked about um, DEI for you know the whole podcast, but sadly we had to talk about recruitment a little bit at least. Um, and uh, I guess the one final thing is if somebody does want to get in contact with you and find out a bit more about Avanti Search or just get some more advice from you, I guess, what's the best way for them to, uh, to contact you? They can shoot me an email at sabrina at avantisearch.com.au, um, hop on the Avanti Search website or find me on LinkedIn. Amazing. Great. Well, thank you very much. Have a good evening. And uh, to everybody listening, don't forget to subscribe. As I always forget to say, don't forget to subscribe. Um, so don't forget. And uh, have a uh, pleasant rest of your day. Thank you so much, buddy. You have been a delight. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Sabrina.